cries of a rabid dog have never ceased to haunt me. And the screams of its human victims as they came down the street of the village when I was a child. Now, 63 and partly paralyzed, Pasteur had begun work on rabies. Although not a major killer, it was the nature of rabies that made it legendary. A single bite would lead to convulsions, paralysis, and death. Keep your hands steady, monsieur, keep it steady. The onset of age rule about which I can do nothing. For some time now, Pasteur had been certain that rabies was passed on to man in the dog's saliva, and that he would find the rabies virus in these samples. Since we cannot see the rabies microorganism, we must find better ways to grow it and study it. I'm well, supposing, supposing we concentrate on the nerve centers. Indeed, working with rabbits, Emile Roux had injected the animals and then grown and cultured the virus in their spinal cords. But always independent-minded, he'd worked very much on his own. Whose is this? Well, it must be Ruth. How do you know? It's his shelf space. In these flasks was suspended the rabbit's spinal cord. Roux was simply testing how long the virus took to die. Pasteur saw beyond this to a practical application. to go to the glass blower, get him to make three dozen bottles exactly like this, only bigger, so that I can speed up the drying process. All right? And get some potash. He had the idea that before the virus died, it might become less virulent and so could be used to make a vaccine. However, he omitted to tell Rue what he was doing. Monsieur Roux, who made these? Monsieur Pasteur. When? Yesterday. Why do you think he has to copy my work, Eugène? Tell him that rabies can be his now. I no longer have any wish to be associated with it. Tell him. Tell him he can scramble to glory on the back of someone else. Forced to continue without Roux, Pasteur injected more rabbits with rabies. After they died, the spinal cords were dissected out, and the longer they were left to dry, the weaker the virus in them became. Finally, in a spine 14 days old, liquefied and injected into a dog, the virus was so weak it no longer killed. He then found that by using progressively more virulent doses, he could accustom his dog to the virus. Monsieur Pasteur. Monsieur. He had a vaccine. The dog. Completely well. No problems at all. <laughs> Come on. The long incubation period of rabies meant the new vaccine could be used after the bite. But in spite of these encouraging results, Pasteur was determined not to rush into using the vaccine on humans. He was indeed thinking of using himself as the first guinea pig when on July the 6th, 1885, events overtook him. Monsieur Pasteur, I, I'm looking for Monsieur Pasteur. That is Monsieur Pasteur, madame. Then will you save my child? I suggest you try a hospital, madame. Monsieur Pasteur is not a doctor. Your son, sir? No, sir. 
It was my dog that bit him. Then why do you come here? The dog was rabid, sir. I was bitten on the arm. We took him to a doctor in Strasbourg. Then your doctor will have done all that is necessary, madam. I am only a chemist. Uh, it was the doctor who told us to come here, sir. He said you could cure rabies. In animals, madam. Only in animals. Examination showed that Joseph Meister had received 14 separate bites. The vaccine had to be given as soon after the bite as possible. What about Joseph? I'm afraid I can do nothing for the boy. Then he... he'll die. He may not. <laughs> I'm very sorry. But you arrive on my doorstep, madam, unheralded and unannounced. And on the testimony of hearsay, ask me to save your child. You make things very difficult for me. Bring him back again at five o'clock. But I promise you nothing. What deterred Pasteur from inoculating the boy was not only his own doubts, but the implacable opposition of a large number of doctors who resented a chemist meddling in medical affairs. Fearful of the consequences of helping, he consulted an old friend at the academy, Dr. Edme Vulpian. The whole gaggle of resentful medics urging me to make a mistake. And those with small minds all shout loudest, monsieur. I need Emil Rue. He understands as much about rabies as I do, but he's against inoculation. If I do it, I do it alone. You can count on me. And if I fail? The boy will die. But if you don't try to save him, he'll die anyway. And there's always a chance you could succeed. Since the death of the child was almost certain, I decided, in spite of my deep concern, to try on Joseph Meister the method that had served me so well with the dogs. The operation was performed in the presence of Dr. Vulpian by Dr. Jacques Granchet, one of the first French physicians to study bacteriology. The vaccine was, to say the least, crude. A piece of dried rabbit spine, 14 days old, crushed and mixed with veal broth. Yes, sir. Not the painful experience you'd feared, was it? And what if he dies? What is the world going to say about the great Pasteur then? Well, what happens to one boy now, Emil, can't affect what you've achieved in the past. It'll be four years' work gone. Just like that. We neither know how the vaccine works nor why. And if it fails, when it fails, what are we going to tell France? We're sorry? It worked on dogs? A few dead dogs in a field and nobody cares, but a few dead human beings, that's quite a different matter. Then stop this self-imposed exile and help us to discover why it works. He stole my idea, Loire. No, Emile. And whose idea was it in the first place to study the weakening of the virus by exposure to air? And whose was the crucial idea to make a weakened vaccine that way? Oh, yes. Always the final theatrical gesture for the greater glory of France and after that humanity. He almost ruined our work on anthrax by announcing his method prematurely. Now he's about to do the same with rabies. No. I could never work with him again. I must tell you that I'm seriously beginning to question your motives for opposing him in this way. 
satisfy you. Well, this is what we should be looking at. A major killer, diphtheria. Not indulging in theatricals like human inoculation. Pasteur needs help on rabies. This is the bacterium diphtheria, which produces devastating effects throughout the body. Heart failure, paralysis, kidney damage. It is only found in a small membrane in the throat. So how does it produce this total bodily disruption? Answer that question. And we may come to grips with one of the real fundamentals of bacterial behavior. Instead of that, the whole laboratory is preoccupied with producing a vaccine we can't understand against a virus we can't see. Vaccinating that boy was premature. And what is more unscientific? Mr. Meister? I decided to give a total of 13 injections spread over a period of 10 days. The strength of the rabies vaccine was carefully determined by inoculation into the brain of fresh rabbits. This method showed that the medulla used in the first five days was not virulent, whereas that used in the last five days of the treatment was increasingly virulent. That's the plunger. I don't seem to be getting the right pressure from my thumb. Try the other syringe. I've got it ready. Oh, no, no, no. This will be all right once I get it started. Dwar. Give Joseph his injection with the other syringe. Come into the other room. You must have treatment. No, no, no. It's quite unnecessary. I insist you have treatment. If you wish. I was injected once. Very weak. The same as Meister's first three injections. My God, I... I anticipated many things, but never this. Are you really going to have the treatment? Do you think, young man, that I would do this every morning if I wasn't absolutely sure of the method? Fortunately, we have an abundance of the vaccine already prepared. I suppose I should feel some degree of honor being only the second man in the world to undergo Monsieur Pasteur's rabies treatment. can't let him go through with it. With a virus that strong, he has little choice. Does he know the risks? Well, perhaps not as well as we do. He's never worked here before. He's mad. Oh, no, he's not mad. Have you ever seen a case of rabies? No. Well, you see what the dogs look like. Now, imagine that in a man. The seizures are the most terrifying. You only need the smallest movement, the slightest noise, and every muscle in the body goes rigid. The noise they make. All one can do is to give them morphia or chloroform for the pain, until eventually they die of exhaustion. Eugène, we can't let him do it alone. I shall be inoculated too. Will you? Are you serious? Well, if we all die, at least Emil Roux can explain to the world that uh, we had faith in our own vaccine. Who was being treated? Was it Pasteur? No. It was a man I saw with my own eyes through that door. Now, who was it? You should pay as much attention to listening at keyholes as you do to looking. Who was it? Granche, Viala, and me. 
I don't believe you. You're out of your minds. We work with the stuff. How do you know we won't be infected? We could be infected already. Even you can see the difference between inoculating a child who's been bitten and the lunacy of inoculating a man who hasn't. Or maybe you can't. I have the boy to attend to. During the last days, I inoculated Joseph Meister with the most virulent virus. He escaped not only the rabies that he may have received from the bites, but also the rabies which I had inoculated into him. Today, gentlemen, three months and three weeks from the time he was first bitten, Joseph Meister's condition does not leave anything to be desired. One success acknowledged in the course your own survival, which remains a professional secret. Every person bitten by a rabid dog must be given the opportunity of benefiting by this great discovery. The possibility of establishing a treatment clinic must be investigated at once. And the world and his wife will come. ...of such a treatment clinic would seal the fame of our illustrious colleague and bring glory to the whole country. Humanism seems to be in danger of destroying common sense. We still have no feeling of the new... It works, Lou. It works. Now that the treatment was to be offered to the public, the need for an explanation of how the rabies vaccine worked was even more important. Ironically, a major step towards a theory, based on research and not mere speculation, already existed. It was the work of a Russian zoologist, Ily Mechnikov. A warm, highly emotional man, he was also prone to fits of deep depression. This had led to two attempts at suicide, and he was here in Sicily recuperating from the last one, which had followed his dismissal in 1882 from the University of Odessa for political activities. Now, in the sea off Messina, he'd been occupying himself with a study of primitive marine animals, in particular, the minute larvae of starfish. It was whilst doing this that, in his own words, the great event of my scientific life took place. Ah, success. Torniamo a terra. Mechnikov had a makeshift lab in an apartment that he shared with his wife Olga, five of her brothers and sisters, two servants, and an odd job man. Come on, you two. Come on. Come on, we'll be late for the service. Tiny, look at your hair. Ah! We're all careful. Stop the stomach. We're all the stomach. For more than 10 years now, Metchnikov had been studying digestion in primitive animals, animals without a stomach. He'd seen how their food was digested by millions of scavenging cells moving throughout their body. 
But he'd also seen cells like these in quite advanced animals, like the starfish, which had digestive organs. So he was now wondering what the function of these scavenging cells was in higher animals. This was the question he was hoping to answer with his studies on the larvae of starfish. I was alone with my microscope, observing the life of the mobile cells of a transparent starfish larva, when a new thought suddenly flashed across my brain. It struck me that similar cells might serve in the defense of the organism against harmful intruders. I said to myself that a splinter introduced into the body of the starfish larva should soon be surrounded by cells in the same way as can be observed when the white cells surround a splinter in the finger of a man to form pus. No sooner had the idea occurred to me than I decided to put it to the test. There was a small garden to our dwelling in which we had a few days previously organized a Christmas tree for the children on a small rose bush. I fetched from it a few rose thorns and introduced them at once under the skin of those beautiful starfish larva, as transparent as water. The precision needed to place the tiny tip of thorn accurately in the animal's body made this an enormous and unique achievement. But the reaction, he knew, would not be immediate. Even if it occurred at all, it would take at least 12 hours. That night, I was very nervous. I couldn't sleep. All I could think about was the results of my experiment. The next morning, very early, I went to the room. When I looked down the microscope, I saw with great joy that my notion had been correct. The mesodermic cells of the starfish larva, as if for protection, had completely surrounded the thorns. It worked. It worked. <laughs> this experiment was the basis of the theory to which I devoted the next 25 years of my life. By chance, passing through Messina at this time was one of the most influential scientists in Europe, the pathologist Rudolf Virchow. At one time, he'd been in politics, leading the opposition against Bismarck. That is, until Bismarck challenged him to a duel. Now he was the doyen of German medicine, his support invaluable, his criticism most damaging. Hearing of Metchnikoff's work, he went to see him unannounced. You want to see the starfish material? Huh? He's waiting. Oh, please, my dear. There's no point in bringing him in here until I have the material ready. What shall I do? Show him the garden. As with most subjects, his knowledge of flora is unparalleled. Oh, but Eli. Please, my dear. May I show you the rest of the garden? Thank you. you realize they are not actually flowers at all. They're a form of modified leaf. Professor Virchow, I'm most honored. It was rumored you were in Messina, but I didn't expect you here. Well, I heard about the starfish larvae. My informant, Professor Kleinenberg, was most enthusiastic. I'm very glad. I would welcome the opportunity to be as enthusiastic myself. Though, to be honest, to avoid disappointment, I've already balanced my curiosity with a large degree of skepticism. You're welcome to see what I have. Thank you. You'll excuse us, my dear. Madam. How do you find Messina? A very agreeable. It's an opportunity to enjoy the softness of the Sicilian winter and exchange for the high. Come here. Come here. Sonia. Alex, go find Nina. Tell her to prepare some wine. Quickly. Sure. Do you see the white cells? Mm-hmm. And do you see the spores of the parasites within the white cells? Mm-hmm. 
white cells have actually devoured them and are in the process of digesting them. This is your most important evidence? Huh? A natural disease observed under natural conditions. A very good experimental model, don't you agree? It seems to me there's more than a hint of supposition in your theory. Supposition? How so? Well, you could equally well say that the parasite has penetrated the white cells. And far from being destroyed, is actually being transported all over the body by them. That is what Cox says he is. Oh, Cox is quite wrong on this count. His evidence is purely circumstantial. And yours isn't. No. Look at this series of drawings. Made as I observe the process of digestion taking place, the parasite is slowly surrounded, sometimes by more than one cell at a time. Well, this can't be interpreted as, as the parasite invading the white cell. In fact, there might even be something on this slide. Now, let me see. They're not always easy to spot. Ah, yes, look. One parasitic cell surrounded by several blood cells. Well, I can't see how anyone can interpret that as anything but an attack on the parasite. Does this digestion happen every time, or are there variations? Oh, yes. You can observe uh, small variations uh, between individual animals. But the largest variation I've seen is in the recent work I've been doing on rabbits vaccinated against anthrax. In the unvaccinated animals, the uh, white cells appear sluggish, almost indifferent to the bacteria. But in the vaccinated ones, their activity is remarkable, quite remarkable. They, they congregate around the bacteria in vast numbers. Interesting. 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 It all ties in so well. If the behavior of the white cell varies, as you say, between individuals, between the vaccinated and the unvaccinated, I begin to see a pattern emerging. This is not a complete answer, but really most exciting. But my ideas run so counter to the general belief, I hardly dared hope that anyone might take them seriously. No, no, no. Yours is a truly original observation. I've learned more today from your preparation than I have from 20 years of dispute. <laughs> ah, but enough. I mustn't keep you from your family. Oh. Have you made plans for publication? No, I haven't. Metchnikoff was to name these white corpuscles phagocytes, after the Greek, the devouring ones. The fact that he'd seen these phagocytes grow slowly more accustomed through vaccination to fight against microbes they'd previously ignored was just the theoretical support that Pasteur needed. Metchnikoff's results were published with Virchow's backing in 1884, but their significance was not grasped. Without a theoretical backbone, the fate of Pasteur's vaccination program remained as uncertain as ever. Pasteur's rabies clinic was open next to his laboratory in October 1885. As Roux had predicted, people bitten by rabid dogs came from everywhere. 19 Russian peasants, all attacked by a rabid wolf, had arrived from Smolensk. The preparation of the vaccine had become the chief occupation of everyone, except Roux. Monsieur. Can you tell me how much you charge for the rabies treatment? I can assure you, madam, were I actively involved in this clinic, my services would be quite free, including the post-mortem. Marcel Rado. Oh, yes, yes, I recall your face. You've been here before? Yes, monsieur. And you know what to do. Well, 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 quite a little gathering. I understand, Pasteur, you're awaiting the arrival of four children from New York. News travels fast. Let us hope the circus is worth their while when they arrive. I do wish, Rue, that your hostility on these public occasions was a little less overt. What was the number of your Louise Pelletier. That you or the child? The child. It says here that the child was bitten by a mountain dog on the 3rd of October. Yes. But that's... That's 37 days ago. A very long time. 
All these people. They came much earlier. I didn't know. Wait there a moment. It can't be too late. It can't. Would you oblige me with a word? Of course. Excuse me. I want you to confirm me my decision. Young girl, bitten five weeks ago, the first time in the clinic. But she must have rabies. Right, so we should refuse to inoculate. Oh, yes. The vaccine couldn't possibly take now. No. But you must refuse for your own sake. No. I was half hoping you would disagree with me. We've never turned a child away before. Pastor, if the patients see you fail, they'll stay away and die. And if the doctors see you fail, they'll be on you like a pack of wolves. By not acting, you are exchanging the death of one child for the recovery of many more. I know what it will mean to the parent. You have no option. I'm afraid we have to say no. You see, if the child already has the disease, the vaccine won't do any good. No one said. I do understand. <laughs> I've changed my mind. I had a daughter once, two daughters. One had a tumor, the other typhoid. We could do nothing for them either. I wish I could have saved your child. Monsieur Pasteur's new intensive treatment consists of making from 16 to 40 pinpricks, depending on the gravity of the bite. He calls this inoculation. I call it tattooing. <laughs> Jealousy of the balls. The opposition that Pasteur had expected from the doctors had been growing. It was led by Professor Peter, professor at the City University and a distant relative of Pasteur. The Peltier case provided just the ammunition he needed. Mr. Chairman? Gentlemen, I wish to quote from the Medical Journal of Paris. You can be monarchist, anarchist, nihilist. You can deny the existence of God, but you mustn't doubt Pasteur without being struck down. <laughs> As one who neither acknowledges Pasteur a God, nor fears that he will strike me down, I will ask him to explain, in public, the recent death of a young girl who was the recipient of his treatment. I suggest that Monsieur Pasteur's so-called treatment is anti-scientific, ineffective and dangerous. Could it not be that Monsieur Pasteur's vaccine is killing the patients, not Pasteur the microbes?
presume that the learned professor, when he refers to microbes, is actually referring to microorganisms. <laughs> A small but indicative slip. In the face of the prevention of one of the most fatal diseases known to man, my detractor sees fit to exercise his irony. That is his prerogative. But to distort the truth is not. He is well aware of the official inquiry, which concluded that of the 320 cases they studied, 40% had died from bites by rabid dogs. But sir, how do you know the dogs who bit your patients were rabid? Answer me that. He also sees fit to ignore the figures quoted by my colleague, Professor Boulay. I can only hope, gentlemen, that he suffers no remorse at having plunged into despair and uncertainty those many patients who have already been inoculated through the auspices of this academy by telling them that they have been subjected to an ineffective and dangerous treatment. Let them rest assured they will not get rabies. And I will not debate with a man whom I consider to be incompetent both as a clinician and an experimenter. I will be prepared to listen if and when Professor Pater can support his views by experimental and clinical facts. It was shortly after this exchange that Pasteur suffered another stroke and was forced to rest, leaving Roux in charge of the clinic. Roux, meanwhile, continued his work on diphtheria. This was mainly a disease of children. As many as 50% died. Almost all were left paralyzed or with weak hearts. <laughs> There is already an active discharge from this child's throat. You'll find your microbes highly active, sir. Extremely acceptable to you, somewhat less acceptable to the patient. What's the color of the actual membrane? Already yellow. In spite of the misery he found in these wards, Rue's preoccupation was not with treatment, but with the mechanism of the disease. There, monsieur. Thank you. Like others before him, Rue had only found these club-shaped bacteria on a small membrane in the throat. So how did they cause such damage throughout the body? Did they secrete a poison that was carried round the body in the blood? Rue was determined to find out. He took the microbes and grew them in flasks of broth. After four days incubation, he used a very fine porcelain filter designed by himself to separate the microbes. He was left an amber-colored filtered liquid. If there was a poison secreted by microbes, it would be here. The liquid filtrate was completely clear, slightly acidic and free of living organisms. I injected it subcutaneously into animals in doses of two to four cc's. I waited for the telltale signs, the ruffled hair, the dragging legs, but nothing happened. There must be a poison there, there must be. Emil, I just there's no spread of diphtheria microbes, there must be a poison or why should people die? They're saying another child has died of lab rabies. The Reviac boy, the, the one that was kicked whilst he was playing outside the clinic. His doctor reported kidney failure, but now there are rumors. Why do you tell me? Rabies is Pasteur's concern, not mine. I should have known. With Pasteur away, and Rue still hostile to the rabies treatment, Loire was left to investigate the death of the Reviac child alone. Yes? Uh, Monsieur Reviac. I'm from the Pasteur Clinic. He killed my son. I don't understand. Ask the Commissioner of Police. On the face of it, Loire had little to worry about. The boy seemed to have died from kidney damage resulting from a kick he received while playing. But then the father made an announcement. By the time an autopsy conducted by the pathologist Bruardel began, everyone, including those opposed to Pasteur, like Clemenceau, knew that before he died, the boy had suffered paralysis. 
Monsieur, the representative of Pasteur's laboratory. What is it of this that you want? Take what you want. This paralysis was a symptom not found in rabid dogs or humans bitten by them, but it was found in the rabbits used to make the vaccine. The boy could have contracted rabies from the vaccine itself. Loire and Bruardel had both agreed to test for rabies in the boy's brain. Any doubts about the vaccine's safety would be extremely damaging. The Medulla Oblongata, monsieur. Whatever for? Gentlemen, I will conclude by saying that I believe, subject as I expect to my finding no rabid traces in the spine or brain, that the cause of death was blow to the left kidney. The brain tissue was prepared for injection into the brain of a rabbit. The telltale signs of rabies would occur, if they occurred, within 48 hours. Two days later, early morning crowds waited for the clinic to open. Meanwhile, inside, the worst possible fears were realized. The rabbit was paralyzed. It had contracted rabies. Shall I take the creature away? Yes. Well, you're going to open the clinic. Wouldn't Pasteur? You're going to go on vaccinating hundreds of people when there is a doubt. There is no doubt. Bruadel's official report says he died from a blow to the kidneys. We don't have to say anything. We still have no idea how the vaccine works. You've no inkling whatsoever how that boy died. Eli Mechikoff would say that the blood cells digested the disease too quickly and burst. Well, perhaps he's right. I'm afraid it is my duty to tell Bruadel. If Bruadel has done his experiments, let Bruadel tell us. I shall go to him tonight. If that is where your allegiance lies, Emile, then go. On Rue's visit to Bruardel, he was accompanied by Loire. For an hour, the two men inside discussed whether or not to reveal the results, while Loire waited outside. Bruardel's experimental conclusions are the same as ours, and is not afraid to reverse his original official decision. But he believes to admit to the world that the boy died of rabies would put back the science of immunology by 80 years. And he's right. The boy died of a blow to the kidneys. A boy. Revoyac inoculated by Monsieur Pasteur's intensive method has died. The very method that seems to have elicited such loyal support from Monsieur Pasteur's colleagues patently failed to save the boy's life. So why did he die? He died, as I have suggested, of other cases on previous occasions of rabies. I would remind the professor that the floods of albumen that I found on the boy's urine made death consistent with a blow to the kidneys. I can find no conclusive evidence that would make me find it necessary to reconsider my original finding. Then why, sir, did a blow to the kidneys produce in the victim visible signs of a rabid death, spasms in the throat and foam around the mouth, and most important of all, paralysis? Paralysis, you say, is not normal in a man suffering from the bite of a rabid dog. Nor is it. But where is it normal? I'll tell you. It is normal in experimental animals injected with laboratory rabies. And where is my evidence? Who is my authority? One who's standing amongst the members of this gathering could not be higher. 
I refer, of course, to Monsieur Pasteur himself. Am I correct in believing that Professor Peter is not just pointing out a few failures, but accusing Monsieur Pasteur and his colleagues of murder? All we want is proof. So, in its absence, I assume that this gathering accepts that my assertions and all that they imply for the future of Pasteur's clinic and of vaccination in this country, that my assertions are correct. Rue's resistance to the whole vaccination program was well enough known, so his reaction was awaited with interest. Mr. Chow, gentlemen. Like Professor Peter, I too have my doubts about the wisdom of inoculating human beings and the death of Jean Réveillac, which no one here can adequately explain, will feed those doubts and those uncertainties. But I ask the professor to set his doubts aside, not to forget them, but to set them aside for the sake of the general good. No, sir. For his accusation that the treatment is dangerous is based on mere prejudice. What does he want? To prevent all people bitten by mad dogs from coming for Monsieur Pasteur's treatment? Is he prepared to take responsibility for this action? If he is, how many deaths will he have on his conscience? Professor Peter attacks one of the greatest discoveries made by man. I have no fear when I say to him that he has conducted a base and deplorable campaign. <laughs> This complete reversal by Rue saw the effective end of Peter's opposition. Gentlemen, gentlemen, thanks to the work of Monsieur Pasteur, French science has been placed on the topmost rung, and I propose that an institute be set up and that that institute be called the Pasteur Institute. <laughs> There's where you'll be working. Yeah. I see. Uh, the laboratories are quite impressively equipped. Uh, perhaps too impressively. You do me great honor to invite me here. Oh, that's one thing I was determined to do. To see that the staff consists of, of people whose work I approve of. You're very kind. Oh, no, no, no. Your, your theory on phagocytes was the only one that was backed by observation uh, and which made sense. I believe you're on the right road. And yet it's not the opinion of Emil Roux. <laughs> How difficult it is to obtain the triumph of truth. Opposition's very good stimulant, but bad faith. Such a pitiable thing. Then I had a brainwave, incubation. The microbes in a child's throat must incubate for several weeks, so I allowed my microbes to do the same. Instead of four days, I left them incubating for 42. And I was right. The longer they incubated, the more lethal they became, till eventually a minute dose would kill off countless guinea pigs. So you see, I have proved that in diphtheria, it is not the microbes that kill, but the poison they secrete. So we should now be able to acclimatize the animal and so produce an immunity. You cannot produce immunity, Monsieur Roux, unless the white corpuscles eat up the microbes, as I have proved. And with uh, diphtheria, you say you have no microbes, so phagocytosis is impossible. Then you will have to adjust your theory to accommodate my discovery. I will adjust my theory when you produce a vaccine which produces immunity. Oh, oh I beg your pardon. Oh, no, no, I, I was sorry. just leaving. <laughs> Au revoir, gentlemen. I feel very fortunate in having him here. He's amiable, but misguided. Perhaps you'll both be proved right. <laughs> well, monsieur? I know you don't expect me here, Emile, but I've just received a letter and I think it's the most important thing I've ever had. It says, please will you find a cure for diphtheria? Our children to, to whom we teach your name as benefactor 
will owe their lives to you. The Battle of Rabies is won, it seems. No, don't, don't mistake me. I'm not here to crow. I, I respected your reasons. But how do I reply to diphtheria? That one day, you hope to find a cure? Yes. Yes. Oh, my son. If only I had another life before me. With what joy I would enter into my researches on crystals. Pasteur Institute was officially opened in the autumn of 1888, built with money from public donations. It is with bitter grief that I come here. A man vanquished by time, deprived of my masters, even of my companions in the struggle. It is a hard task when you believe that you have unearthed a scientific fact and want to tell it to the world. It is a hard task, I say, to train yourself for days, for weeks, sometimes for years, to fight with yourself, to try and ruin your own experiments. But when, at last, you have arrived at a certainty, your joy is one of the greatest which can be felt by a human soul. And the thought that you will have contributed to the honor of your country renders that joy still deeper. For if science has no country, the scientist must have one. And French science, by obeying the laws of humanity, tried to extend the frontiers of life. For the next seven years, until his death in 1895, Pasteur did no more original work. Eventually, Emile Roux was to take over the direction of the Institute. The great French triumphs of the last 25 years were over. The research on diphtheria, so brilliantly begun by Roux, was to be continued by Emile Bering in Berlin. The initiative that had been with France slipped slowly away to Germany. <laughs> 